So, I thought we could start with some augmented reality, but we have to talk a little bit first about your reality, which is, well, this is, do you know this, this newspaper? I've seen it. You've seen it, yeah. So this is uh, last Friday's paper, Snap Logs Slow Down in Digital Ads. And so I'm not going to read the whole story. It's a great, it's a, it's a great, you probably didn't think it I read it, I read it. Yeah, okay. Well, for those that didn't read it, it, uh, you know, it covers that the stock is down 85% year over year. It covers uh, the outlook for next quarter isn't great. Didn't even touch on your net worth. So I want to give you, I'm going to give you that. But since you are in the augmented reality business, how would you augment this reality? What do you want the picture to look like? You're, you're a camera company. Oh, goodness. Well, first of all, great to be here. <laughs> I Beautiful thought, night. I, um, I, I told you we'd, so, we'd start soft. Yeah, no, I know. We appreciate it. Um, good to just dive right in. So anyways, um, uh, I, I think, you know, as we look at Snap and, and how the business has evolved over the last 11 years, uh, what we've really tried to do is, is focus on enhancing people's relationships with one another, with their family and friends, and with the world. And we started by doing that through our camera. We, we focused on visual messaging because at the time people were using text message. It was really, really slow and kind of clunky and hard to understand how people felt when they were just reading uh, these words. And so uh, we, dis we discovered that people could communicate you know, much more quickly using images uh, and, and of course videos and, and sending them uh, back and forth. And that use uh, of the camera opened up a whole new set of business opportunities for us because it turns out, you know, the camera was really being underused in terms of just saving uh, memories and, you know, important moments. And as soon as people started using the camera to communicate, they also realized they could use it for a lot of other different things, like telling stories, for example, or adding content to our map so you can see what's happening all over the world, uh, you know, near uh, real time. And most importantly, now people are using our camera for augmented reality. So. 250 million people engage with AR on Snapchat every single day. And they started out using it for things like self-expression. So in the beginning, people felt uncomfortable just sending a selfie to their friend. But if they used AR and layered in these creative tools, right, that put dog ears on their head or help them vomit a rainbow, they felt comfortable uh, expressing themselves. And, and what we found over time was that AR could evolve into other more utilitarian use cases. And so people now use AR to try on a new pair of clothes, right, without having to go into a changing room. And that really helps uh, merchants. People are using AR to extend their concert experience. We found that artists uh, were getting frustrated that everyone was just holding up phones at, at concerts, right? They felt like technology was getting in the way of the concert experience. And artists realized that through augmented reality, they weren't going to be able to change the fact that people are holding up their phone, but they could make the concert experience much more immersive. So. As we look at the future of the camera over the next you know, 10 years and beyond, I think we're just at the very beginning of how augmented reality uh, you know, is really going to bring computing to life in the world around us. And how does that translate to your stock price, to making the company and, and really your user base grow? I didn't realize this was an investor meeting. <laughs> um, this, uh, so. We're gonna, we're gonna get to the augmented reality. I, I, think, I think what we found over the years is just by focusing on our community, which is now I think 363 million daily active users, and bringing them products that they really love and enjoy, and then figuring out, of course, how to you know monetize our community. I think now we're about on a five billion dollar run rate in terms of revenue, um, you know, which I think at, at the time when we were just starting Snapchat and just playing around with visual messaging, nobody thought. Uh, was possible. But I, I think, again, just staying focused uh, on our community, on, on giving people products that they uh, really love, and then, of course, working to you know, help our partners grow their businesses through advertising or you know, expanding the opportunity we have with our subscription product called Snapchat Plus, which gives people you know, experimental products and features, or AR Enterprise, which takes all of our AR technology and tools and helps embed it in other people's applications uh, and websites. These are all ways that you know, we can make money and, and of course generate more cash flow which should translate into a higher share price. But I, I think all of that you know, comes after really serving our community with products that they love. And when I sort of hear you talk about a lot of these problems, I wonder how m some of the problems around the stock price could just be solved by you not being a public company. Do you, do you have these moments of wishing you know, a few years ago Maybe shouldn't have gone public. Maybe it was a different route. 
Well, I, I think, you know, if, if you believe that your own personal scorecard is the stock price, being a public company is a terrible idea, and I, I certainly wouldn't recommend it. I think for us, if you look at Snap and the reason why people come to Snap and want to be a part of our team, of course, it's, you know, for the vision, you know, of empowering people to express themselves and live in the moment and learn about the world and have fun together. It's the, you know, the scale of our reach, 363 million uh, daily actives, and it's the impact, because we're only a team of about 5,000 people serving 363 million people. Mm -hmm every single day. And so that is really motivating and inspiring to our team. And, and I don't think they you know, use the, the stock price to, to measure their success. And I think they believe that if we continue to focus on the inputs, like I mentioned, things like you know, serving our community, that over the long term, the stock price uh, will sort itself out. All right, so you're hoping Elon Musk does not call and <laughs> offer any money he has left. <laughs> um, I want to talk, so you're, you mentioned around augmented reality, the idea of sort of going beyond filters. How do you get more people to think? Because one of the things I love about using the app is that I, I've tried on shoes, right? I can try on shoes, I can see how that looks, I can try on makeup. How do you get your users to think beyond? I mean, how do you, and, and as you're looking at the design of that app, how do you think beyond, this is just fun lenses? Well, I, I wouldn't underestimate the power of fun. I mean, we always talk about this Eames quote that toys are the preludes to serious ideas, right? And, and this idea is that if you can really entertain people and give them something that they enjoy doing, that you know, that's the beginning of building uh, a big business. So you know, when we first were uh, playing around with try-on of clothing, it was virtual clothing, just stuff that we thought was fun and, and silly. It wasn't until much later that we started working with luxury brands to bring you know, true size sunglasses into our products so that people could actually see what they look like and, and you know, convert through the application. So I, I wouldn't underestimate the power of fun and giving people new ways to express themselves. And over time, those can evolve in, into quite meaningful businesses. Uh, when you think about sort of adding that the, that, well, I, are you still a camera company? I was going to ask a lot of questions about the camera, but I just wanted to, do you think of it as still you're a camera company? We are a camera company, and that's why we open directly into the camera. I mean, unlike so many products that open into a feed of other people's content, we've always opened into your own experience of the world around you, and then overlaid that, of course, uh, with augmented reality. But we still believe that the camera is going to be, you know, the most transformational tool over the next decade. TikTok, how much do you hate them? <laughs> I, I, would, I would use the word admire, admire them. Yeah. Okay, but, like, but fundamentally it's a different product, right? Um, we've had discussions about this before, right? And you open up to the camera, you want people to share. TikTok opens up to an algorithmic feed that is gonna keep you there for hours. Now, of course, that's why engagement is up on that app. But when you think about it, when you use TikTok, are there parts of that that make you think we maybe missed the boat on certain things or you've worked into the product? Uh, well, really, I think TikTok just represents the power of using algorithms to personalize content, uh, which is something that we've focused on for a long time through our Discover product. And, uh, you know, I remember in the early days uh, when ByteDance had a product called Totia, which was really a newsreader application, they were innovating because they said, look, people aren't going to just read the content that their friends are reading. They're going to want to read content that's personalized for them, and you, we're going to use machine learning to do that. And so we learned a lot from that, and, and we use machine learning a lot to, to rank Discover content and, of course, rank uh, spotlight content and make uh, recommendations. And so we're always trying to learn from what innovative companies uh, are, are doing. And it's certainly true that people prefer content that's personalized for them. I think, you know, building a business around a feed is very challenging because it's, it's difficult to differentiate. And that's why we focus so much on visual messaging between friends and family because people always want to talk to their friends. They always want to talk to their family. And so they come into our service all day long to do that. And then we can offer them other products like our AR platform or our map or of course our content products as well. Yeah, so it sort of strikes me as like you guys can be this idea of the super app. Tell me what, tell me what you think about when you hear the word super app too, because we, we've heard a lot about this over the last number of weeks from Elon Musk and others. I think that idea really comes from uh, seeing the role that messaging apps have played uh, in China. And we were very fortunate early on to learn a lot from Tencent, uh, who has a very big business that really was built around messaging because they discovered that if people were talking to their friends all day long, they could learn from what people were doing. And they, you know, in the early days saw that people were leaving conversations with their friends to play games. And so they realized, oh, if we just build games into our messenger, then maybe people will play games together and continue having those conversations. And they were able to build a massive gaming 
messaging business. And, and over time, they just learned that that frequency of engagement around messaging can allow you to build a very powerful application that stretches beyond messaging and into other areas of delivering value uh, to your community. So we certainly learned a, a lot from that, and, and that's why we've been able to expand our platform over time into all these different areas. Is, do you think that the U.S. market fundamentally struggles th with this? I, I think where the U.S. market and Western markets have struggled is typically in the, in the payments area. So one of the things that was very interesting about the early days of messengers in, in China was that there weren't necessarily the same sort of established payment rails that there are here and in you know, Western Europe, for example. And so there emerged uh, a lot of payment use cases in those applications um, that we don't necessarily see replicated here in the United States just because we have, you know, I think, more of this legacy infrastructure. And, well, what I, well, we'll shift gears in a second. I want to talk about more AR and, and metaverse. But when you think about your user base, well, let, let's just do a show of hands. How many people here use Snap? How many people here's kids use Snap? OK. As you expand into AR, as you want to grow the user base and engagement, how do you capture more of this audience or even younger audiences? Well, what we found to be most effective is to just grow with our community. One of the things that we found is that once people learn how to use visual messaging and they you know, are able to see what their friends are up to all day long and communicate in that really rich and emotional and exciting way, they don't want to go back to text message or the telephone. And so what we've really tried to focus on doing is building innovative products and then giving them to the demographic that's most excited to try them, which happens to be... Uh, young people normally. Um, and, and so that's really been our strategy over time, that if we're going to innovate, we want to give those innovations to the most engaged and excited demographic that is always looking to try new stuff. And then as long as we can continue to deliver real value to our community, they'll stay with us and grow with us. And that, that's why today, you know, I, I think we reach more than 75% of 13 to 34 year olds in more than 20 countries. You know, that's like the US and UK and France and, you know, uh, et cetera. So, um, you know, that, that's really been our uh, approach to aging up is just continuing to deliver a lot of value to our community as they grow with us. Yeah, I definitely find that as people, I, I find especially around people that read news on there, it's like they've been reading the Wall Street Journal for years on through the app, and you can tell that they've sort of followed along. So I want to ask you to finish this sentence. The metaverse is? Living inside a computer. <laughs> you don't want to do that? <laughs> the last thing I want to do when I get home from work at the end of the long day is, is live inside a computer. So. Uh, <laughs> What are you, yeah, no, no, no. no please, please. Finish your thought. I'm going to put I, you inside a computer if you don't finish <laughs> your thought. What I was going to say is I, I think we're just at such an interesting time in, in computing. So, you know, if you look at the last, you know, what, 20, 30 years, computing has evolved enormously from the mainframe, desktop, laptop, you know, now it's inside your pocket on your smartphone and computing has gotten a lot more personal. It's gotten more interactive. It's gotten more immersive. Um, it's certainly gotten more... Uh, social and and I think what's what's clearly been driving that trend right is, is really a desire for computers to, to be more portable to be you know lighter to make it easier to get them out of the way to put them out of the way and what we think is so interesting is that there's such a clear fork in the road at this moment where you have a group of people who's talking a lot about the future of computing in terms of virtual reality which you know as I mentioned is a lot like you know this vision of living inside a computer and then there's this whole other uh, group you know like us that are really focused on augmented reality which is really about harnessing the power of computing while getting it out of the way, right? And, and I think we just talk to so many people that feel like computing or even their phones get in the way of enjoying the world around them and, and that they want to immerse themselves more in, in the world uh, around them. They really enjoy reality and they feel like computing puts a lot of friction in the way of that. And so the promise of augmented reality is to give you all those benefits of computing without a lot of that friction, uh, without the feeling that your computer is you know, making you stay at your desk or has you know, got you fixated on this tiny little screen. So that's, that's why we're so excited about augmented reality. And I'm excited about it too, but I think, and as I, I've written about this, like, we don't quite know what that app is, that killer app that is going to make us want to put on the glasses, or even hold the phone up, right? Will you guys figure that out? Will that be some other company that figures that out? Will it be the hardware makers that figure that out? 
I, I'm not sure it's necessarily going to be one killer app, which is why we're so focused on building this developer community. There are now hundreds of thousands of developers who are building these augmented reality experiences called lenses uh, on, on Snapchat. There are millions of these lenses that have been created, and you can easily bring them across to our glasses uh, mm -hmm. called Spectacles. We, we currently release them only for uh, developers, but people are building all sorts of really interesting uh, experiences. And I think a lot of the hints for what's to come in the future can actually be found on on the smartphone today, much like people were using you know, instant messaging on the desktop before it exploded on, on, on the smartphone. And so when we look at what's happening uh, on, on Snapchat uh, today and we, we see the way that you know, people are learning about the world through augmented reality, there was a great lens this week that shows people how to do you know, CPR in augmented mm -hmm. reality. And it's really different than watching a static video or clicking through uh, you know, some, some pictures when you can really see what it's like. Uh, you know, it helps you learn faster because that learning is much more uh, I experiential. So, you know, I, I have of course shared some of the examples around shopping or around more immersive concert experiences. I think all of those are early glimpses into how glasses will be used in the future, but the experience on glasses is just so much more compelling because it's truly immersive. Are you guys going to make the glasses? I mean, let's talk about hardware for a second. So, this is the Pixie. This is your drone. Let's see if it, let's see, I, I want to try to fly it up here. I think, I, I mean, how many of you guys have seen this work? See, nobody knows how it works. Okay, so let's see how it goes. You're scared? Terrified. Okay. <laughs> We're just going to take a picture together. It's going to be okay. Uh, this is the one I want, right? All right, let's see. It's not windy. Don't worry. It's totally fine. Up, oh, up. Oh, okay. It's finding its way. All right. He's going to go backwards. It, it. Uh, what mode did you put it on? I put on the reverse, I thought. Here, hold on. All right. So this is a completely, it's a completely, well, you tell. You, you, so how does this work? Uh, <laughs> what, what we discovered is that people really wanted more ways to, to make videos that they couldn't necessarily make with their phones. Uh, and, and so we, uh, figured out how to, how to build a drone that'll follow you around uh, and come back and, and land in the palm of your hand. And one of the things that, that I've really enjoyed doing is making a bunch of fun uh, videos with, with our kids running around. I mean, you realize as a parent, oh, uh-oh. It's going. Keep going. You realize as a parent how few videos you have together with your children. You know, you're always the one holding, holding the phone. And so to be able to play in the backyard and make, you know, really uh, priceless video uh, with Pixie is a lot of fun. So there we go. Okay, so, yeah. I, so here's the thing. <laughs> this thing's amazing, right? It comes right back to you. Come on, come on, little guy. Come on, you got it, you got it. No, 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 don't make me get up. I loved this thing. I thought it was so fun. And now I gotta ask you, why'd you, why'd you kill this baby? I'm gonna make, I don't want to make you cry. It's, it, is, it is a uh, fabulous and low margin uh, product. For, <laughs> yeah. uh, in a world of 5% rates. So it's, uh, that, that, that was a, a really fun product and you know, obviously heartbreaking to discontinue something like that. But we're really focused uh, you know, really on, on three key areas as, as a business. Continuing to grow our community, of course, around the world. Uh, you know, reaccelerating our revenue growth, which, uh, you know, as you mentioned, is, is very important, and, um, and inv investing in, in augmented reality, which is just so critical to our long-term future. And that, and that, you know, sort of focus means making hard uh, decisions, like, you know, uh, shutting down a, a product that we really love. But I think there are a few uh, left, so while supplies last, you can probably uh, grab one. Special rate for everybody? <laughs> but, but just to be clear, it's not the end of hardware for Snap. You still want to make hardware? No, not at all, because we're, we're really using hardware to explore what the future of augmented reality is, is going to look like. I mean, you know, eight, eight years ago when we started working on augmented reality and put it inside the Snapchat application, we saw how engaging it was for people who were using our products and, and playing around with, with lenses. And it was so engaging on this tiny little screen where you have to use your thumbs to navigate. And we were like, wow, you know, what if this were much more immersive, right? Rather than you know, being stuck staring at this tiny screen, AR is actually overlaid in the world around you. You can use your hands. You can walk around. Uh, you, know, you could use computing in a totally 
uh, different way. I mean, there, there's <laughs> such a there's a hilarious little game um, in Spectacles where you kind of have a zombie chase you around. It's perfect for I Halloween. Yeah. But the, but the first thing that people realize is that they can move. And that's something that's so different than the way that we're used to using computing today, whether it's on our phone and, and we're afraid of falling over something, walking down the side, you know, sidewalk, or you've got VR on, you're worried about banging into a lamp or something in, in your house. When you realize that you can use AR, get the benefits of computing, but move around in the world around you, uh, it, it's really compelling. And, and no one was working on you know, consumer-grade AR glasses at the time, so we just decided to take a very deliberate step-by-step -step approach, you know, starting with camera glasses, eventually adding displays, and... And now we've got a product, you know, product that's out there that developers are using to build really compelling experiences. It feels like a lot of Meta's ambitions in AR and VR are a little bit fueled by the fact that in the mobile ecosystem, they didn't have control of their operating system. They didn't have control of the hardware. Is that, as you think about that, is, and you head into this next wave of computing, are you thinking about how much you can control that platform? Is that part of this? No, it's, it's, it's really not so much about control. It's really about unlocking the potential of augmented reality, which today is very constrained by the capabilities of, of uh, the smartphone. And don't get me wrong, AR is going to evolve like crazy on the smartphone over the next you know, decade. Uh, but to really you know, un unlock the full potential, I think it requires more immersive technology. I want to ask about Apple, because obviously you guys started on the, the iPhone, and uh, I want to ask, you know, we're going to have two Apple executives here after, and one of them who specifically worked on the app transparency uh, feature, uh, ATT, which limited your ability to target ads on, in Snap. You've said previously you, know, you, were, you were okay with that move. How do you feel about that now? Do you, do you blame any of the current issues that we talked about in that paper on on that move? Well, we, when we go back to the, the beginning of Snapchat, one of the things that we have always really cared about is privacy. I mean, we were really the first to pioneer ephemeral communications, this idea that, you know, to make your digital communications more like real life conversations, they should just be deleted after you have them instead of being stored forever. And at the time, you know, people really questioned that approach. Uh, now, today, I think people have realized the value of privacy and how important that is. When, when we started working on our ad platform, we did it in a way that we could protect our community's privacy. And we, we you know, never offered some of the much more privacy invasive you know device level targeting that that other platforms did because we didn't think that was the right thing to do for our community and and I think what we've seen over the past uh, you know several years is that people's trust in online platforms has been eroded because they feel like their privacy has been compromised or you know they've witnessed uh, you know disinformation and, and I think that's very harmful to the industry overall and so when Apple announced uh, these changes you know we, we were extremely worried that they would be disruptive and they and they certainly have been. But we also made clear that we were aligned with, you know, the the uh, overall goal of, of really trying to improve privacy, uh, you know, for uh, uh, users of, of Apple phones, but also more broadly in the industry. So I think it's very important for maintaining long-term trust with uh, people who use technology products. Uh, but it's it's certainly disruptive and, and continues to be. And, you know, I, I think the, the good thing, I'm, I'm optimistic, is Apple does continue to iterate. They're now on their fourth version of, of SK Ad Network. They're making improvements. And so while this transition has been disruptive, I see a real commitment from the Apple team, you know, to continue to improve so, so that their developers can, can be successful on their platform. And one thing that I think it showed largely in the industry is the dependence on data and the data needed for advertising. You guys have rolled out Snapchat Plus, which is a subscription offering. Is there a future where, where more people pay to use social media, maybe even with the hope that not as much data is collected? Oh gosh, I you know I, I would separate the two in in a sense because you know when we look at when you when you talk about data collection right what you're really talking about is the inverse of great recommendations <laughs> and if you look at where technology is going in the future it's really dependent on great recommendations that's why technology makes our lives so much easier you know the services that we use understand our preferences it understands what you know what people like us also enjoy so that it can it help us find that information 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 much more easily. Uh, so so I, I, I think that you know, platforms are going to continue to find ways to collect data in a privacy safe way and use that data to make great recommendations. And that, that really underpins, uh, I, I think, a lot of where technology uh, is continuing to go in, in, in the future. Um, but I do think there's a huge opportunity for us to add more value to our community through products and features. And our subscription business is a great way to align one of the things that we you know, feel like 
we've been good at and, and really enjoy, which is making stuff, uh, innovative stuff that, that people like to use. And so we figured out that you know, a subscription business could really align our desire to you know, really make products for, you know, we got this great uh, group of people on Snapchat who use our service you know, 90 out of 90 days or something like that. And, and they really have specific requests for us of features that they'd really love, but those features have been harder for us to prioritize because we're often prioritizing things that benefit our entire community. But by offering this subscription product, we can super serve that community that's really passionate about Snapchat and you know, charge a small amount, three ninety nine uh, a month for those uh, special features. So it, it's very early, but you know, I think within three months of launching Snapchat Plus, we have a, a million and a half paying subscribers. So it's a decent you know start, and we'll just continue iterating and, and dropping new features on a regular basis. No, that makes that makes total sense. I want to sort of end with to where we are right now in the tech landscape. You've got it's an interesting time, right? Meta is struggling with focus. Google seems to have turned into the post office. They are you know, trying to focus on how to be more efficient. Uh, it's unclear. Uh, you've got Amazon admitting that it's bloated. Is there a benefit to being smaller right now? You're pretty tough on some, <laughs> <laughs> some iconic companies. Um, wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if Google's the post office, then we're really screwed. Uh, no, this. Uh, this <laughs> uh, you're going to be great at delivering mail. I, I, th <laughs> no, I, I think there's tremendous opportunity for Snap. We're, we're really fortunate to be growing our business, you know, as, as you mentioned, on a much smaller base with a smaller team with a ton of opportunity in front of us. So just in terms of where we are in our, our life cycle, there's an enormous amount uh, of opportunity, e even just in, in the near term in terms of the growth of our community, you know, our revenue. You know, if you look at our average revenue per user, I think we're still a fraction of Twitter's average revenue per user, even though our community in, in the United States, uh, you know, at least in terms of like daily active users or month MDAU is like double, I think. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I think the scale of our platform means we've got a ton of opportunity and, and you know, the ability to, to be uh, nimble and adapt to what is a very volatile operating environment. And I, I wanted to ask too, I, as a leader, just, you know, to sort of reflect as you've obviously had a, Rough couple months from layoffs, and yes, yes, the paper. Um, you know, how have uh, how have you've navigated that, and have you learned anything to you know impart to people in the audience that that also have to sort of manage through tough times? Yeah, well, this this article was a lot better than the one you all wrote in 2018, which was <laughs> brutal. Uh, but uh, I I think ultimately the thing that motivates us is serving our community and. At the end of the day, uh, and and early in the morning, uh, that's that's what drives us to do the work that we do. Um, so so I think as long as we can continue to to delight our community, that uh, again the the rest sort of takes care of takes care of itself. And and so I think for other leaders out there who are working through these really challenging times, I see them motivated by a lot of similar things. They're motivated by customers. Mm -hmm. They're motivated by uh, innovating. And. And I think you know right now, um, you know, it, it's really a time for businesses to work together to navigate uh, these challenges. We've certainly tried to really make an effort to super serve our partners and our community during this challenging uh, period of time. Um, because ultimately, you know, while it can be really tempting in a tough moment to, to focus inwards, to focus on your own business, I, I think what we've always found, whether it was navigating the pandemic or some of our early business challenges, focusing on our community and our partners, and, and making sure that you know we, we're really delivering results for them is always what you know leads to long-term growth. Well, Evan, thank you so much. As a parting gift, I give you that paper. But thank you so much. Really appreciate you coming.